The World We Create, From God to Market, by Thomas Bjorkman, read by Mark Meadows. We seem to be living in a strange state of growing cultural estrangement and disorientation today. We struggle to find convincing answers about who we are as individuals, as a society, and as humanity for that matter, which values we should espouse, what is true and what is fake news, and what on earth we are headed towards, and thus what kind of future society we should build. We live in a time of fast-paced, deep-seated changes, but many of us are not at all able to understand what is going on and what they should do. This collective confusion and lack of direction is arguably one of the primary reasons for the widespread sense of insecurity and anger that turned into the UK's attempt to withdraw from the European Union and the election of Donald Trump as President of the USA. The pervasive value vacuum of our time can make it hard to see any greater meaning with our existence, what the value of our shared society and culture is, or why we should bother getting involved in making the world a better place. We may then get caught up in our own little private world's illusion of happiness and retreat to an innocuous existence, wrapped up in ourselves, our daily chores and needless consumer choices. At the same time, there are many who realise we cannot continue as we do today. We are destroying the environment and depleting our natural resources at a frightening pace. And while stress and depression are epidemic in the rich world, people in the poor world continue to die from curable diseases and malnutrition. And even though we as a global community are getting richer every day, we are also getting more and more unequal, locally as well as globally, which poses a serious risk to our future well-being in terms of violence and political instability. It is no wonder that many people are worried and scared. Sadly, simple answers to complex problems often become very appealing to our emotion-driven Stone Age brains when we are upset. And when there are no clear common value systems, and when liberal democracy and the market no longer deliver the basic security and prosperity we seek, regressive ideas, which were previously held in check, suddenly begin to appear attractive to many. Primitive ideas such as fascism and racism get a new chance when we look for simple explanations instead of asking complex questions. And when neither the political establishment, our scientific institutions, nor the market provide any potent responses to these complex issues, then we have a serious problem. So, are there any convincing alternatives to the simple answers of fascism and fundamentalist religion? I believe there are. And that is what this book is about. Throughout history, the ever-increasing complexity of the world has repeatedly prompted us to revise our understanding of reality, the intellectual tools we use to make sense of it, and the narratives at the core of our culture. Mostly, the alterations we make to our intellectual tools and symbol systems are merely piecemeal adjustments to accommodate a few analytic incongruities here and a couple of societal changes there. But every now and then, the many small changes add up and reach a tipping point in which even our most central symbol systems, the overarching meta-narrative, appear utterly out of tune with current reality. Historically, this has often coincided with what I call a phase transition or a paradigm shift to a new thought perspective. A thought perspective is the overarching foundational view of the world that shapes, more or less, our entire way of thinking. How we interpret symbolic and sensory information, including our own thoughts. What kinds of narratives we tell ourselves about the world. How we relate to others. How we organise society. How we work even how we have sex. A thought perspective is the glue that holds our inner world of symbols together and gives them meaning. You can think of a thought perspective as the frame through which we collectively make our worldviews cohere. Others would perhaps make do with simply calling them worldviews. But for me, it is not only about seeing the world in a certain way, it is just as much about how and what we can think. Thought perspectives contain symbol tools, updated software for our brain, that enable us to think in new ways. 
the emergence and development of thought perspectives is a central theme in this book, and it has largely been written from a conviction that we currently are at a critical phase transition from one thought perspective to another. But as history teaches us, such developments are highly unpredictable, especially if we do not come to grips with the peculiar dynamics between determinism and chance, order and chaos. Chapter 1. From the Big Bang to Homo Sapiens Our universe is a merciless place. It is governed by a law-bound force exerting a destructive tendency that, over time, breaks down all physical structures, creating chaos out of order. Scientists call it the second law of thermodynamics. Simultaneously, a complementary self-organising tendency determined by strange chaos mechanics, constantly gives rise to locally increasing order and complexity, thus creating order out of chaos. Chaos and order are the core of the evolutionary processes that have brought everything into being and eventually will break everything apart. Things are born, they die, and from the destruction of one sort of order, new orders are born in a continuous process towards locally higher levels of complexity. The human being and its mind are results of this cosmic evolutionary creation process. We are the most complex entity we know of to have emerged from the universe's propensity towards self-organization. Mind arose from organic matter, which emerged from complex chemical compounds, which again was the result of physical processes that began before matter, space and time even existed as distinguishable entities. All the way from atoms to molecules, to organic cells, to thinking creatures such as ourselves, pondering how it's all connected and stubbornly asking what it's all good for, we see a developmental process of self-organisation towards higher levels of complexity where each step is intimately related to each other. We are thus all the result of events that can be stated in terms of physics, chemistry and biology. However, to understand the human being, we cannot solely rely on the explanatory models provided by the natural sciences. The human being is a creature of such high complexity that we need qualitatively different symbol systems to grasp it, such as psychology, anthropology and sociology. Yet we should still include the biological, physico-chemical and astronomical aspects in our creation story if we want to understand who we really are. I thus propose that we go beyond the intellectual apartheid that prevails between the natural and human sciences and that we approach the human being and its culture and society from a perspective that goes all the way back to the birth of the universe. History from this grandest perspective of all can help us put our anthropocentric notions aside so that we can obtain a more universal and comprehensive perspective on reality, history and ourselves. This can enable us to see how the physical and cosmological processes that began with the Big Bang follow general evolutionary principles that also apply to how we as persons and how we collectively as societies develop. In fact, we will, through the book, be moving back and forth between three scales of evolution and development, the personal scale, the collective scale and the universal cosmic scale. We begin our story on the universal scale with the Big Bang almost 14 billion years ago. This is as far back as we can trace and imagine the world. From a single point of extreme density and heat, where space, time and matter still do not exist as separate dimensions, this primordial state suddenly expands at an astronomical speed. During the first milliseconds, the smallest components of matter emerge elementary particles that soon thereafter form the first atomic nuclei, which around 400,000 years later start to bind electrons so as to form the very first simple atoms, hydrogen and helium. Something new and more complex is thus born from something less complex, an emergent phenomenon whose whole is more than the mere sum of its parts. An atom is namely not just a bundle of elementary particles and electrons, it has new properties, 
e.g. mass, malleability, boiling point, that did not exist in any of its constituents prior to forming the atom. The emergence of more complex structures from less complex ones has characterized the evolution of the universe ever since the Big Bang. From elementary particles, to atoms, to molecules, and finally to organic cells. At every stage in this continuous development towards higher complexity, each emergent phenomenon brings novel properties into existence that cannot be predicted, deduced from, or reduced to what came before. Surprises, so to speak. So, what causes this to happen? One of the driving forces behind the universe's propensity towards self-organization is gravity. Around 400 million years after the Big Bang, enormous clouds of matter begin coalescing under the force of gravity. What emerges are, however, not just dense balls of atoms, but yet another emergent phenomenon, stars. As gravity pulls atoms increasingly closer together, the pressure and heat in the centre goes up and eventually reach a point where the simple hydrogen atoms fuse into heavier and more complex helium atoms. This is an emergent property of stars that could not have been deduced from or be reduced to an individual atom. The universe was a very dark place prior to this, but the fusion process generates a residual product in the form of radiation, light, which is thrust into the cosmos. The emergence of fusion also gives rise to higher complexity on a smaller scale. Many of the first stars are very large, much larger than our Sun. Accordingly, the gravitational pressure and the heat they produce are also much higher, which makes the fusion process faster than in smaller stars. Consequently, the gigantic stars run out of hydrogen more rapidly, which makes them collapse under their own weight. When this happens, pressure and heat increase drastically, causing the remaining matter to fuse into even heavier and more complex atoms, such as oxygen, carbon, iron, and many of the other elements we know from the periodic table. The outburst of energy from this process is so great that the star eventually explodes into what we call a supernova. The newly formed complex atoms are thus ejected far into space along with residues of hydrogen and helium. This is where we find the origins of our solar system. Some 4.6 billion years ago, a huge cloud of debris from an ancient supernova begins to contract, which, from the shockwave of another supernova nearby, triggers the process leading to the formation of our Sun. The Sun makes up about 99.9% .9 of all matter in our solar system. The remaining 0.1% belongs to its eight orbiting planets and other smaller objects in the solar system. Matter blasted out from the early formation of the Sun coalesces into these planets shortly after the Sun's formation. The lighter materials end up farther away from the Sun, forming the large gas planets, such as Jupiter and Saturn, while the heavier materials end up closer to it, forming the rocky planets such as Venus, Mars, and our own planet, Earth. Once again, something more complex has emerged. Yet, gravity is not the only source of complexity in the universe. The effects described by quantum mechanics also play a decisive role. Without going into further detail on this complicated branch of physics, it suffices to emphasize the major discovery of quantum mechanics, namely that subatomic particles behave quite irregularly. This had a crucial effect on how complex patterns formed after the Big Bang. Because subatomic particles behave rather chaotically, they did not spread out evenly along a deterministic and linear course, but varied slightly in their individual trajectories and thereby ended up at different distances from each other. Though minor at first, the irregularities on the smaller scale thus shaped the overall structure of the universe by forming higher densities of particles in some areas and lower in others. With the expansion of the universe, the empty space that appears between matter is therefore rather asymmetrical, which makes it possible for the force of gravity to form points in space with higher complexity and vast areas with no complexity at all. Vacuum empty space. In what appears to be a fundamental principle, 
complexity in one point is always the result of, or at the expense of, less complexity in another. The after-effect of this asymmetrical expansion of the universe can to this day be observed as the small temperature differences in the cosmic background radiation. This is a sign of the varying densities of particles in the early universe from which stars and galaxies would later form. Accordingly, the cosmologist Max Tegmark has suggested that the cosmic microwave background is to cosmology what DNA is to biology. At first, the universe is a hot and dense place in a state of near thermodynamic equilibrium. But as it expands and cools, its initial symmetry is broken. This is decisive. The breakdown of symmetry is crucial for the transition towards higher levels of complexity precisely because complexity is characterized by being non-symmetrical. In a completely symmetrical universe, no further complexity than a uniform cloud of particles would be able to form. Had it not been for the random behaviour of particles described by quantum mechanics, the universe would merely consist of a homogeneous soup of hydrogen and helium atoms. A uniform gravitational field simply would not have had anything to work with, so to speak. However, because the irregularity of subatomic particles made them bounce around space in a slightly uneven manner following the Big Bang, over time these initial minuscule irregularities added up so as to form greater density in some points and less in others. From here, gravity begins to draw matter even closer together, which eventually leads to the formation of stars, galaxies and finally planets such as our own Earth. However, physics cannot explain all there is to the world. In the Milky Way, there are no social constructions such as money, matrimony or countries, nor are there consciousness, objectives or meaning, merely blind forces. But on a small planet in a distant part of one of the many billions of galaxies, a new emergent phenomenon has begun to develop that is so complex that it cannot be described in terms of physical processes alone. What happens here differs so radically from the physical processes to have occurred up to this point that we need to complement the scientific models we have used to describe the creation of the physical universe with new symbolic language systems such as chemistry and biology to properly address the higher complexity at these stages. We now find ourselves on Earth around 4.5 billion years ago. This planet came to orbit its star at a close enough and adequately far distance to provide the optimal Goldilocks conditions for life. Here it is neither too cold nor too hot for complexity to evolve further. However, Earth is not yet a hospitable place, but a semi-fluid hot mass that is slowly solidifying. Collisions with space materials bring with them important chemical elements from which the much later creation of plants, animals and humans can emerge. Frequently occurring volcanic eruptions make the surface of the Earth an even more inhospitable place, but they add gases to the atmosphere that are vital for all organic matter later on. The surface of the Earth is still a crude and barren place, but in the sea, chemical processes are now occurring from which life will later arise. This new emergent phenomenon, life, is so different from anything before that it appears as if it almost breaks the laws of physics. The 19th century physicist Sadi Carnot made the discovery that energy never disappears but just changes the forms in which it exists. This observation is the basis of the law of the conservation of energy, also known as the first law of thermodynamics, which states that energy can be transformed from one form to another, but that the total energy in an isolated system is constant. Energy itself is always conserved, so to speak. The second law of thermodynamics states that in closed systems such as the universe, the amount of free energy the type of energy that can perform work, tends to dissipate over time. In closed systems, all energy differentials will sooner or later diminish. 
This leads to a universe that is increasingly less ordered, less complex, as it moves towards a state of total thermodynamic equilibrium. At the same time, there is a steady increase in the amount of unusable energy known as entropy. The radiation, or heat, we can observe by the aforementioned cosmic background radiation. The vast empty space that emerged and has continued to expand after the Big Bang has accordingly been described as a gigantic entropy dumping ground. The fact that the universe is constantly expanding entails that it will become increasingly colder since the heat needs to spread out over an ever larger area. So as the universe is constantly moving towards equalizing all heat differentials, it is thereby in a way dying a slow heat death. The second law of thermodynamics applies to all closed physical systems, but as the physicist Erwin Schrödinger pointed out in his influential book What is Life, it does not apply in the same way to the open systems that we call life. Obviously, all life forms cool off or die without any influx of energy from the outside, but since they are open systems and have intricate mechanisms to take up energy from outside themselves, they can thereby counter the arrow of history and over time be built up instead of broken down. Complex structures therefore need a constant throughput of energy to help them climb entropy's remorseless down escalator, and the higher the level of complexity, the more energy is required. Complex creatures like mammals require more energy than less complex ones like insects and complex biological organs like brains likewise require more energy than other body parts. A human brain, the most complex entity we know of, is accordingly the most energy-consuming phenomenon in relation to size. This principle also applies to human societies. Complex industrial societies require much more energy than simple farming societies. Without fossil fuel or any equally powerful energy source, our society would grind to a halt. It thus appears as a general rule that the larger and the more complex a phenomenon, the greater the energy flows. As such, complex entities do not really counter the second law of thermodynamics. They actually speed up the process of entropy yet further. This seems to apply to all stages of complexity. The more complex, the faster the pace of entropy. In this way, there is an ironic twist to how life counters the ruthless law of entropy. Complex forms of lifeless matter, such as stars and planets, are in a dynamic, steady state and tend to be very close to thermodynamic equilibrium because the energy needed to retain their structure is relatively limited. As such, they generate entropy relatively slowly. But more complex entities, such as life, are in states much further from thermodynamic equilibrium. Accordingly, they need far more energy to maintain their highly asymmetrical structures. Being far from equilibrium is simply so demanding that higher energy throughputs are required, which also necessitates higher levels of entropy. In organisms, energy is processed at a much faster pace than in stars, which also entails that entropy is exuded at a faster pace in the former than the latter. To maintain its complexity, life in turn speeds up entropy by transforming high-quality energy forms into lower forms such as heat. On all levels of complexity, this pattern unfolds. During every step in the energy chain, from the fusion process in the sun, to photosynthesis in plants, and finally to the metabolism in animals and humans, ever more usable energy is consumed and exuded into increasingly unusable forms. The transformation of free energy into unusable forms of heat is much faster in stars than in clouds of space dust, and in biological creatures this process is even faster. Complexity thus speeds up the pace of which the second law of thermodynamics works towards its final destination, a universe without order a state of equilibrium where all free energy has been consumed and only a leftover in the form of cosmic background radiation remains. Life is such a decisive emergent phenomenon 
that it represents a transition from a less complex to a more complex level of development. Life acts in ways not observed in the physical, non-biological universe and in accordance with new rules that cannot be deduced from what came before. Instead of losing energy over time, as with stars and hot bathwater, living systems have the capacity to gather energy from the outside and thereby maintain and even increase their complexity. Life is therefore not merely a cluster of complex molecules to be described in terms of chemistry alone, it is something more. We now need new explanatory measures such as biology and the theory of evolution. But what is life, exactly? The Nobel Prize-winning physicist Erwin Schrödinger famously stated that we cannot break it down to a checklist. Neither metabolism, reproduction, nor any other specifics like these are sufficient to define life, since we always end up with exceptions that can be observed elsewhere in the non-organic world. Instead, he argues that we should look at how life on the overall systemic level differs significantly from other phenomena, for instance how the unfolding of events in the life cycle of an organism exhibits an admirable regularity and orderliness, unrivaled by anything we meet with in inanimate matter. Accordingly, life is above all characterised by being significantly more complex than anything else in the known universe. It is fair to say that life constitutes a higher level of complexity due to the increased number and variety of building blocks, number of connections and interactions between them, and the sequencing of these constituents, which far exceed anything else observed in the universe. But there is more to life than its mere quantitative aspects in regard to complexity. We need to remember that what sets one stage apart from another is not only scale, but, more crucially, that new rules and properties emerge on the higher level of complexity that cannot be deduced from its predecessor. The foremost qualitative aspect is, first of all, that life must constantly tap into matter and energy flows from outside itself in order to exist and multiply. This is the newest addition to the game, so to speak, in extension of this, the capacity of life to deliberately maintain and further develop its complexity is another crucial distinction. Under the merciless circumstances of constantly having to find new sources of energy and survive the hurricane of energy flowing through them, to quote David Christian, organisms consistently come up with new ways of relating to their environment that lead to new levels of complexity with no parallel in the inanimate world. As mentioned, this also entails that living organisms produce entropy at a much faster pace. Whereas stars emit relatively little entropy in relation to size and only in the form of radiation, organisms in comparison emit very high amounts of entropy in the form of heat, but as something new even in the form of matter. In order to maintain their complexity, biological organisms must extract matter from their surroundings break it down, and release the excess materials into the environment. Plants produce relatively little material entropy, but animals produce a whole lot more in order to maintain their complex and energy-expensive muscles, brains and digestive systems. In organisms, entropy therefore not only takes the form of excess heat, it also takes the form of molecular disintegration of matter that would otherwise have taken much longer to occur. In organisms, molecules such as carbon dioxide and carbon hydrates are dissolved into their lesser components at a much faster rate than they would have been in an entirely sterile environment. Again, the higher complexity of life coincides with an acceleration of entropy. More entropy is the price we pay for our complexity and observations of life forms in relation to their level of complexity seem to confirm that higher levels always entail larger amounts of entropy. This has been supported by the astrophysicist Eric Chason, who has argued that the level of complexity of various entities, to some extent, is proportional to the level of energy flowing through them, and thus the capacity of the entity to sustain itself against the pressure of entropy, evident by measuring the free energy rate density in units of energy per time per mass. 
it has been revealed that the power density of a plant is 450 times denser than that of the sun, a human body 10,000 times denser, and a human brain contains a power density roughly 75,000 times larger, again in relation to size. As such, the entropy produced by a human brain is roughly 75,000 times larger than that of the sun. Quite remarkable when we think about it. In addition, a notable property of life is how well it handles these energy densities. Life can handle far denser energy flows than stars without breaking apart or exploding, which allows it to climb farther and faster up the thermodynamic down escalator by sucking orderliness from its environment, in the words of Schrödinger. Again, more complexity in one point always entails less in another. Because this is a very difficult task, life has accordingly developed ever more complex ways to withstand the energy flowing through them. A hallmark of living organisms is namely their abilities of self-preservation and the various complex strategies they develop to do so. The way in which life forms retain their recognisable patterns over time from the assimilation of the environment is a feature that distinguishes them from inanimate objects. In theory, life would be able to outlive the sun, given that it finds new sources of energy in the universe. Life is able to retain a stable and coherent pattern, both in form of bodily function and as structure across time, which no other entities are capable of. That is, life can replicate itself, stars can't. A star can only attempt to maintain its equilibrium in a rather undeliberate fashion, while a living organism has proper agency in the way it deliberately strives towards continuing its existence. This peculiarity of life also relates to one of the major differences between the physical and the biological regime, form and function. Whereas stars and planets can undergo differentiation in form, only biological regimes can do so in function. Here we need a new way of talking about the world that is fundamentally different from that we have used to describe innate phenomena, a new symbol language to accompany physics and chemistry, biology. To talk about stars as having the function to keep the galaxy together does not make much sense. But when it comes to biology, it makes perfect sense to talk about function. One of the most fundamental questions in biology is namely what function a part of a certain organism has in order to maintain its complexity and keep it going. Function is thus one of the new emergent properties that life brought into existence. The fact that organisms constantly need to extract matter and energy from the environment is one of the new rules in the game of cosmic evolution. And, to play along, living creatures need to develop ever more efficient and sophisticated functions to accomplish this. Life is subject to the deterministic rules of physics just like anything else, but, unlike inorganic entities, they operate according to somewhat more open-ended rules of change. Biology is on the most fundamental level as law-bound as physics and chemistry, but the rules on this new stage of complexity are quite different and allow for structures further from equilibrium than in the inanimate world. Yet, to ensure their continued existence and proliferation, organisms need to obey the rule that extreme precision is required. The mechanisms to facilitate the delicate task of handling large energy flows must be highly fine-tuned and accurate. Mere approximation is rarely good enough. The precision required has no parallel in the inanimate world. A rock can be ordered rather randomly without any noteworthy changes to its properties but living organisms will break down due to the slightest deviation from a certain order and thus immediately turn into dead matter that soon disintegrates into its less complex constituents. This, however, also makes them exceedingly more fragile. As such, we find the basis of yet another change to the game. With life, a new factor of change comes into being, natural selection. 
Because organic life forms are so fragile and constantly risk elimination before they get a chance to reproduce, a process of constant innovation and adaptability to the destructive forces of the environment come to define the development of change on Earth hereafter. Following the emergence of sexually reproducing multicellular organisms, the next revolution occurs around 450 million years ago when life moves up on land. Initially plants, followed by animals a little later. The first lungfish evolve with time into enormous lizards and dinosaurs dominate the surface of the planet for millions of years until they are eradicated in a major natural catastrophe 65 million years ago. This is, however, not the end of complex life on land. As with previous natural catastrophes, complexity increases rapidly after even this great mass extinction. Small but hardy organisms, sufficiently adapted to survive the harsh conditions prevailing after the catastrophe, take over the niches handed down to them and quickly spread across the globe. One such group of species are the mammals. After the extinction of the dinosaurs, these small creatures are suddenly able to evolve into larger and more complex species, of which one of these eventually evolves into us, Homo sapiens. But in order to understand the success of our species, we must first take a look at our prime asset, our brain, and explore what it is that made the mammal brain so well adapted for surviving and thriving in comparison with the less complex reptile brain. The brain is intimately connected to one of the greatest mysteries of all time, consciousness. But although it is very fundamental to our personal experience of the world, we've always had a hard time explaining what it really is. Much of human intellectual history has been devoted to the question of consciousness and existence, from the great world religions, over philosophy, spiritual practices, and to modern neuroscience, all have tried to create coherent narratives that attempt to explain this fundamental property of existence. Science has always had great difficulties explaining this phenomenon, or even defining it, often resorting to rejecting the matter as pure speculation and irrelevant to how the world really works. Still, it remains one of the most fundamental phenomena of our world, and continues to puzzle humans to this day and age. The evolution from matter to life to mind is as perplexing as it is fascinating. When and where did consciousness emerge? What is its function, and how do we adequately analyse it? All are intrinsically difficult questions to which we essentially just have speculations to base our inquiry on. That, however, should not stop us from pursuing the matter. After all, consciousness is a phenomenon present to us throughout all stages of being, available for further investigation from the very focal point of our own private perspective on existence. Consciousness can therefore be observed, and results can be deduced from our investigation of existence itself. To some degree, it can even be said that consciousness is the basis of all existence, or that it is existence. But let's begin by pursuing the matter in scientific terms. The evolution of brains probably followed the same patterns of development as other organs through the merger of individual and hitherto autonomous cells. The sensors in single-cell organisms, primitive sensors, registering food and danger, may have evolved ways of communicating with each other as multicellular organisms evolved and started a process towards a division of labour between cells. These primitive systems of sensory cells working together to create appropriate reactions to stimuli could have created the first form of consciousness. Having capacities to accurately create images of the surrounding world would have had great advantages. So, as long as there was an evolutionary pressure and a positive reward in terms of survival and reproduction to achieve even more reality-congruent images of the world, evolution would allow for increasingly higher levels of mental complexity. Consciousness can be said to be the capacity to feel sensation. Even without the capacity for self-awareness, 
consciousness is the ability, in the words of Nicholas Humphrey, to have effect-laden mental representations of something happening here and now to me. This was a monumental transition that allowed complex creatures to contemplate and reflect on their surroundings. It opened up the possibility to create mental images of the world, analyse situations and make decisions on a preferred course of action. It made it possible to control large complex bodies and move intentionally to achieve results to a degree that is completely out of reach for organisms without such data processing organs. Even the worm registers its environment. With the aid of a nerve centre with a few hundred neurons, it reacts to the environment accordingly. A neuron, or nerve cell, is the nervous system's most basic unit and is responsible for the reception and transmission of nerve impulses. The nerve signal consists of an electrical impulse that runs through a nerve cell which is relayed to the next. We may call the accumulation of these nerve signals a form of proto-consciousness, a consciousness consisting of sensory impressions, attention and motivation. Reptiles have somewhat more advanced life-adjusting mechanisms than worms. The reptile brain governs the motor control of the body and processes sensory impressions such as sight, smell, taste and hearing. The lizard, with its reptile brain, has an active sense that can focus its attention and register the outside world. In this directed attention, the lizard can register the part of its surroundings that calls it to attention, only then to react, for example, attack or flee from a threat, something the worm cannot do. It is, however, the case of an instinctive, pre-programmed reaction, not a conscious choice. On the next level in the brain's evolution, there are further neurons formed on the outside of the reptile brain, making up the limbic system, which can be found in mammals and birds. They still have a reptile brain, which holds the most basic life-sustaining parts, but the limbic system that encloses it should be understood as something new, not just a larger reptile brain. The limbic system gives rise to emotions, such as fear, excitement and anger, which further regulate the organism's behaviour. The limbic system thereby complements the reptile brain's basic life-sustaining impulses. Because of the limbic system's introduction of these completely new phenomena, emotions, which cannot be derived from the earlier impulses, it is possible to talk about the limbic system as an emergent phenomenon that constitutes yet another developmental step in terms of complexity. Mammals also have advanced memory functions thanks to additional neurons that form the area of the brain called the cortex. With this, they can remember and retain images in their mind. For instance, even if the cat a dog is chasing disappears around a corner, the dog is capable of continuing the chase. It has a preserved image, a memory, of the cat that has disappeared from view. Mammals can, with these memory functions, also learn new things about their environment. For example, where food usually can be found, in contrast to more primitive species that exclusively have to rely on senses such as smell and taste in order to find food in a constant here and now. The cortex is the basis for a first inner world, which we can see in the way mammals play, dream and have inner motivations. A mammal can use trial and error and through curiosity learn what various behaviours lead to. Mammals such as the dog have in their inner world conceptions of things and phenomena that need not be present but can be motivated by and driven towards something thanks to this inner conception without something visible having occurred in the environment. This is a decisive difference from what we see in reptiles which are only instinctively driven away from or towards external stimuli. We have, with the first mammals, definitely reached so far in evolution that we may speak of an advanced form of consciousness that resembles that of our own. It is still not a self-aware consciousness, but a consciousness all the same. Now, thanks to the inner conceptions that can motivate the animal, independently of immediate external circumstances, 
objectives have arisen in the universe. Objectives are something completely new, a new type of reality, an inner reality. Objectives do not exist in the physical world, but they produce very tangible results that can be observed in the way that creatures blessed with these mental constructs succeed in manipulating their surroundings to their advantage. Our inner reality is something that is extremely difficult to approach in scientific terms. The philosopher Ernest Nagel has, in his famous paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat?, proposed that consciousness is what it is to be something, what it feels like to be a conscious creature. He uses the example of a bat because the sensory capacities of these animals using echolocation or biosonar for perception are so utterly out of reach for humans to a degree that we cannot even imagine what it is like to be a bat. We simply have no point of reference. Nagel's approach is a direct attack on material reductionism, the position that conscious organisms are nothing more than the sum of their material constituents, that everything about them can be deduced from the description of the physical processes in their brains and bodies. But mental phenomena as a subjective quality means that consciousness cannot be explained without reference to the subjective character of experience. This renders a purely objective approach of consciousness highly inadequate, since it does not attempt to describe the subjective properties that ultimately should be the subject of analysis. Subjectivity itself is a variable that, per definition, is not accounted for in exclusively objective analyses. If we use the definition of consciousness as that of having experiences, we may infer from empirical observations what is experienced in the inner world of other organisms. By looking at the evolution of cognition, we can investigate how organic entities on various stages of complexity react to their environment and appear to process data. From such inquiries, we may conclude that the behaviour of organic cells seems to express a kind of pre-conscious form of protoplasmic irritability and that plants react to sunlight and soil compositions in ways that indicate the presence of some sort of rudimentary sensation. The behaviour of reptiles shows that they probably have a form of sophisticated perception, and mammals appear as if they, as in the example of a dog chasing a cat, have a capacity to form mental images in their minds. However, all these properties are inner qualities that objective science, by definition, cannot say anything about. From our empirical methods, we can only observe that living creatures react in accordance with certain patterns. What it is actually like to be the given entity we observe, however, what it is like to have that sensation of irritability, impulse or feeling, this we can only deduce from the experience of having similar sensations ourselves. Scientifically, we can only observe the emotional responses. The emotion itself remains out of reach to us as scientists. As famously stated by Bertrand Russell, our brain is known exteriorly by description, but our mind is solely known interiorly by acquaintance. Only the former is addressed by natural science. But that should not lead us to despair. Even if we do not have access to the stream of consciousness of another person, we can still, from their emotional response, deduce what is going on inside, because most of us possess many of the same emotional capacities. If a person is crying, for instance, you can recall the emotion associated with having the same response yourself and conclude that it must be similar to what the other person is experiencing right now. The same goes for the deduction of experiences in lower-level organisms, as famously stated by the writer Arthur Kessler, when a man lies down on the psychoanalyst's couch, a horse and an alligator lie down with him. By this, he means to say that we are governed by many of the same impulses and emotions as animals, since we contain the very same reptile brain and limbic system that we share with other animals. However, this also means that we may have some of the necessary insider knowledge to understand what goes on in their minds. Being the most complex creature on earth, 
and being the result of several stages of transcendence from all those preceding less complex stages of biological evolution, we have on each stage not only transcended those earlier stages, but also included what came before, evident in the similar physical structures in human and animal brains. Accordingly, we find within ourselves traces of all these preceding inner worlds and have good reasons to conclude that our impulses for aggression, sex and hunger must be similar to those in reptiles and that the emotional affection we can feel towards others may not be that different to what a complex mammal may experience towards its offspring. After all, given the similarities in our nervous systems, the sensation of pain we all experience from physical harm probably does not differ that much from animals. An animal may not be able to comprehend the emotional pain affiliated with deep existential anxiety, but since the human mind contains all the earlier levels of mental complexity, we probably have internal acquaintance with most of the emotions and impulses of other animals. As such, it is not entirely unreasonable to suggest that we can draw sound conclusions about the workings of consciousness in general from our own acquaintance of having one of these devices installed ourselves. Our capacity to relate to the inner workings of others also seems to be a hardwired evolutionary feature of the human mind. Most humans have this capacity, which is often referred to as empathy, the intuitive understanding of the subjective state of others. This is not only beneficial for drawing sound conclusions regarding consciousness as such, but is also, as we will see in the following, a capacity of crucial evolutionary importance to highly social beings such as ourselves. Five to six million years ago, apes swing from tree to tree in the forests of Africa, eat fruits and plants, and sleep protected from predators in the tree crowns. Life in the trees requires good coordination between hands for gripping and stereoscopic vision in order to navigate the three-dimensional environment. This, in turn, requires large brains and generates an evolutionary pressure towards increasingly larger and more complex brains. Hands with opposable thumbs will later prove extremely well adapted for manipulating objects and creating tools. Within the course of a few million years, the formation of an enormous rift valley through the African continent results in new mountain ranges and great rivers that cut off the ape populations from each other. The climate changes drastically in the eastern part, where the forest recedes and leaves space for dry savannas. The eastern ape populations quickly adapt for survival in this inhospitable environment. Now they cannot live in the trees and eat fruit as their cousins in the west, but are forced down onto the ground to wander long stretches in search of food. This accelerates the development of a new species of apes and creates evolutionary pressures to favour individuals who are able to move on two legs, which is more energy efficient. This feature may also have protected the first hominids from heat and predators as they could no longer find shade or seek refuge in the trees. Upright walking reduces the surface of the body that is exposed to direct sunlight and having a field of vision at a higher elevation helps detect predators at longer distances. But, most importantly perhaps, standing on two legs means that their hands become free for tool making and the domestication of fire. With time, these early pre-humans learn to hunt. Meat is more energy-dense than plants and enables the development of smaller stomachs, as great amounts of plant material are no longer necessary for survival. Smaller stomachs are also necessary in order to better walk upright and require less energy so that even more fuel can be released to the brain. Increased social coordination of the hunt also requires larger brains, as snatching leaves and fruits is less intellectually demanding than hunting. So, in a positive spiral of constantly smaller stomachs, better upright walking, growing brains and improved hunting skills, these creatures are rapidly evolving into something we might call humans. Around 1.8 million years ago, our brain's size has grown to around 800 cubic centimetres. 
effectively managing the increasingly complex social life has become ever more important. But there is yet another development of our social skills that is just as crucial, one that can be said to be more in-depth in our understanding of other human beings. Not only do we see a greater awareness of the breadth of human society, with further understanding of the intricate social constellations of the group, but a greater awareness of its depth occurs as well. At this stage, we start gaining insights about others as sentient creatures. This development of our mental world can be described as one of acquiring models of others' inner worlds known as theory of mind. It entails a basic understanding of others' perspectives, the crucial insight that others have feelings, thoughts and intentions. This becomes more important as the social complexity of the group increases and survival depends on delicate cooperation with other group members. Empathy thereby becomes a distinct human ability of crucial importance for our species' further evolution. With this, we can understand if someone else is in pain or in need of something. We can feel with another person, and compassion impels us to show consideration towards others, which thereby benefits the group as a whole. This is epochal. As we begin to have conceptions of others' inner worlds, we come to understand others well before we attain a proper understanding of ourselves. For survival, it is namely more important to understand what goes on in other people's minds than in our own. Thus, as a species, we actually become conscious of others long before we become self-conscious. Strength, speed and stamina are still critical, but the capacity to understand our fellow humans' intentions and needs grows in importance. Under the many environmental and social pressures, our brain evolves rapidly. A new sub-branch of hominids, Homo sapiens, turns up in Africa around 200,000 years ago. The brain in Homo sapiens is now around 1,400 cubic centimetres and consists of upwards of 100 billion neurons. At this stage of development, we now have creatures who are physically quite similar to contemporary humans. From here on, only minor biological changes will occur. Not that biological evolution suddenly has ceased, but it progresses incredibly slowly compared to the cultural changes that will occur hereafter. All human beings that live today are, with the exception of a few biological changes such as skin colour or lactose tolerance, genetically almost identical to these early humans. We might say that the hardware is complete. Now it is mainly the software, the programming, which will be developed further. All later development can be said to belong to a completely new regime, that of culture, a developmental step in complexity beyond the biological. It is a new stage of complexity that, just like biology, will accelerate the pace of evolution to a hitherto unseen speed and introduce completely new rules. We are the result of millions of years of biological evolution and still to this date we are part of it. Biologically, we are adapted to a Stone Age environment rather than the urban environment most of us live in today. New branches of psychology have realised the significance of our Stone Age origin in order to understand the human being of today. Evolutionary psychology studies how behaviour and emotions can be explained by our origin on the African savanna, and new investigations in health psychology take into consideration how people are influenced by a modern environment and lifestyle to which we are yet to evolve biologically sufficient adaptations. We are, for example, not adapted to sitting still for long periods, having access to abundant sources of sweet and fatty foods, or living in an urban environment with millions of strangers. At some point in our mental evolution, we became self-aware. Being self-aware is to witness one's own inner world. As mentioned, the ability to interpret others' inner functioning only arrived with evolution, since we needed to manage our social relations. 
but in this process we also realize that others have an inner conception of ourselves, not just of our body, but as persons with an inner world. This helps us become self-aware, just as the child discovers itself as a separate entity through reflections of its parents. Now we start to reason around what we feel, believe and want, instead of simply feeling, believing and wanting without any thoughts about why we do so. With the emergence of self-awareness, we take a first step out of the total symbiosis with nature and realise in a totally new way that we exist as individual persons. Leaving the symbiosis with nature is expressed in the Bible as the expulsion from paradise. We realise that we are naked since we have become conscious of ourselves and we can feel shame and guilt. Self-awareness is an emergent phenomenon that cannot be reduced to its earlier components. It is not an advanced type of impulse and neither is it merely a new kind of emotion. With this development, evolution creates something completely new, a creature that is aware of itself and that can reason about its existence. With this, a new level of freedom also arises. Thus far, all creatures have merely possessed a will. The worm cannot will anything other than to dig in the soil, and reptiles have no other choice than merely reacting to the impulses they experience. But with the emergence of human beings and their complex neocortex, the instinctive will can now view itself and for the very first time choose something else. This degree of freedom is, however, not something that we humans necessarily possess from birth. It is largely a degree of freedom that needs cultural support in our environment in order to develop its full potential, as we shall see in the following chapters. Complexity is arguably related to freedom. A defining feature of higher levels of complexity is, as mentioned in the introduction, the way higher stage structures limit the autonomy, the freedom of their lower level constituents. Organisms limit the way molecules can move around, that is, within the overarching structure of the cell. The trajectories of individual molecules are limited to behave in strictly specific ways to perform the highly precise tasks that ensure the overall structure of the organism. In a similar fashion, on the next level of complexity, multicellular creatures limit the autonomy of cells and make them perform particular tasks. But at the same time, the subjection of lower level entities also gives the higher level entities greater freedom to manipulate their environment. There are simply more things high complexity entities can do than lower complexity entities can. However, today we have the prerequisites to understand how self organizing processes can bring about emergent phenomena without involving anything magical or seeing them as extremely accidental coincidences. There is nothing strange at all, neither a mysterious force of creation nor an equally enigmatic randomness. When an emergent phenomenon of higher level complexity is brought into existence, it is simply because ever more varying units in increasing numbers interact and develop increasingly varying relations and patterns. These new relations and patterns can, in turn, propelled by order and chaos, form emergent phenomena on a higher level of complexity which function in accordance to other rules than those governing the system's components or the preceding lower level state. Every emergent phenomenon exhibits behaviours that cannot be deduced from its components. In fact, emergence is defined as the spontaneous occurrence of new systemic properties that cannot be found in those of the emergent system's individual components. Only when a surprise like this occurs that cannot be predicted from the rules governing the behaviour of the system's components can we talk about an emergent phenomenon. As the evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer has argued, chaotic systems almost always have the peculiarity that the characteristics of the whole cannot, not even in theory, be deduced from the most complete knowledge of the components, taken separately or in other partial combinations. This appearance of new characteristics in wholes has been designated as emergence. 
So, whereas the behaviour of chaotic systems in theory is deterministic according to chaos theory, complexity science adds the crucial exception that this does not apply when they give rise to emergence. A new level of complexity is always the result of such non-deterministic events since the emergent whole they bring about cannot be deduced from that which gives rise to it. What constitutes an emergent whole is also how we can distinguish one level of complexity from another. But without a clear conception of the qualitative aspects of developmental complexity, we can easily draw erroneous conclusions. The conventions of our language permit us to talk about a phenomenon being more complex than another in purely quantitative terms, and to the degree we can comprehend them, for example, when we say that a large computer system is very complex and the fly disturbing us while we try figuring out how it works is a rather simple creature. But this is not a meaningful way of using this term in a developmental fashion. Given its properties of being an organism, the fly buzzing around in simple patterns that we may quickly decipher so as to disintegrate it into its molecular components and carry on our work, belongs to a higher level of complexity than the computer. Scale should not be used to determine the level of complexity either. The entire universe, made due to its sheer size, appear vastly more complex than an ant, but the latter belongs to a higher level of complexity than any of the structures of the former, which only consist of inorganic matter. This is because the ant just like the fly, constitutes a whole that gives it emergent properties that are nowhere to be found in the inanimate world. The ant contains the qualitative levels of complexity of atoms and molecules since it is made of these components, but it also contains additional complexity in virtue of being an organic creature. In a similar fashion, a molecule is more complex than an atom because it contains all the properties of the atom and additional complexity from the particular order of its atomic components. It is important to stress the term deduced when we say such linear inferences cannot tell us anything about the properties that emerge on a higher level of complexity. If we accept a reductionist approach, it is not conceptually invalid to say that complex structures consist of nothing but their parts, but it is theoretically incorrect that we can deduce the properties of an emergent phenomenon from its parts. It simply remains to be seen how even the best knowledge about the properties of atoms alone can predict the behaviour of a molecule, or how we can use chemistry to predict those of an organism. The notion that everything fundamentally is made of nothing but subatomic particles is therefore as simple-mindedly reductionist as it is theoretically inadequate. Being an expert on particle physics will not help us explain how air particles can form tornadoes, how carbohydrates and amino acids can assemble into life forms, or how neurons can bring about poetry and algebra. These are all phenomena whose emergence cannot be deduced from the components giving rise to them, and neither can the former be reduced to the latter. And if we wish to give a comprehensive explanation of a human being, accounting for the biological processes of each and every body part and how they are connected, simply does not suffice, since humans belong to a level of complexity above that of biology. We remain organic creatures, just as much as humans and single-cell organisms remain chemical processes, but we are also something more than this. We are cultural beings. We are interdependent systems within larger systems within an interconnected whole. A holistic and developmental picture thus arises from complexity. From a perspective of chaos and complexity, we can commence a paradigm shift away from the one-eyed focus on analysis and reduction, but without getting mired in a converse narrow focus on mere holism and synthesis, which tends to overlook specifics. With this way of thinking, we can place ourselves somewhere in between the components and the entirety, the particular and the universal, and realise the beauty in the diversity that thrives on the edge of chaos. But high complexity not only gives us more freedom to manipulate our environment, 
it also entails higher freedom to govern ourselves, and thereby, we might also say, greater responsibility. We can create future objectives that motivate and propel us forwards, but these are often in conflict with our immediate wishes. Our immediate lower-level impulses may impel us to move in one direction, but our higher-level mental faculties may convince us that we need to go in another to better fulfil our overall intention. This can often be quite difficult. In order for us to stick to our intentions, we need fortitude and mental power that only can be derived from our higher-level faculties, which again often need careful cultivation. Only the human being can decide to go against its immediate impulses without any external factors to force its behaviour. We may want to follow our immediate impulse and eat all the fish we have caught at once, but if we realise that it is detrimental to our overall intention of staying alive, we can decide to save some for the winter. Our biological instincts still play a role, but with this ability... We have become something other than just biology. We have become cognitive creatures that can check and govern our biology through the power of thoughts. We have developed the ability to prefer a future need over a present one. We can choose between our present self and a future self. Although other animals prepare for the winter and perform tasks to benefit them later on, these appear to be merely instinct driven behaviours. As far as we know, Humans are the only creatures who deliberately plan for the future and repress their immediate desires to favour a future goal. But since such behaviours are not derived from inert instincts because they need to be learned, the extent of which we manage to postpone our desires and go against our immediate inclinations is largely determined by our social structures, our moral systems and the shared values of the group to discipline our behaviour. Other social species have mechanisms to impel group members to comply with the overall well-being of the group, but humans are the only one that use non-physical means, commonly shared mental structures, to do so. And those groups that have developed the most sophisticated and efficient measures have likewise been the most successful ones. Step by step, millennium by millennium, human societies have created ever more efficient measures to control their desires and instincts and to increase the discipline of its members. This is quite remarkable, as it has occurred without any noteworthy changes to their biology. 200,000 years ago, we are biologically fully developed modern people, but we still live in a ruthless natural environment as an animal, among others, with threats at every corner, Around the same time, the climate deteriorates as another ice age begins. These privations bring our species close to extinction. Groups of maybe just a few thousand survivors make their way to southern Africa. These particularly harsh circumstances probably lead to yet another evolutionary spur in our mental and cultural evolution. The people that remained were probably the ones with the most creative solutions and the greatest cognitive capacity, since they found ways to handle the difficult conditions. It is probably under these demanding circumstances that our symbolic thinking fast tracks towards its current capacity and our language becomes more complete. The tens of thousands of survivors that remain around 75,000 years ago are the ancestors of us all. This little group of Homo sapiens disperses through Africa and out into the wider world. Around 60,000 years ago, we reach Asia via the Arabian Peninsula and then further on to Australia. When the ice retreats back north, we wander into Europe. This part of the world is already occupied by our hominid cousins, the Neanderthals, who have emigrated from Africa a few hundred thousand years earlier but now they are rapidly being outcompeted by the newcomers. A little further on, we also spread to America as the first larger land-based creature since this continent was separated from the rest of the world. The human being's adaptability is a key factor in explaining why we succeeded with this. We can live on food from the vegetable kingdom as well as from the animal kingdom, 
and we can survive in many different climates and under various ecological circumstances. The most important factor for our adaptability is, however, that we rely on our thoughts, that we use tools, and that we have language for social interactions. But even though we have inhabited most of the planet's climate zones for thousands of years, we are, biologically speaking, still tropical creatures. Our preferred environment lies within a temperature range between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius, similar to the dry and stable climate of the East African Rift Valley, a Goldilocks condition in which we thrive and one we attempt to recreate wherever we settle by constructing shelter. But the savanna is still our ancestral home. Not rarely have modern people expressed a primordial feeling of belongingness to the African savanna when visiting it for the first time. As such, it is striking how we seem to have tried to recreate this landscape in our parks and backyards. Grasslands dotted with single trees. Not dense forests, jungles or swamps, but savanna-like landscapes seem to be the environment where we feel most comfortable and at peace. A hundred thousand years of evolution in other climates have not been enough to distance us from our original home in Africa. The next chapters will be devoted to how these Africans evolved, not biologically, but culturally.